What is the only country in the world, Ian, where we have a base that borders China? Afghanistan. Why would we give up a base that's on the western flank of China, southern flank of Russia, and eastern flank of Iran if our concern are on those top three adversaries? Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today, President Biden promises to boldly go where the past three American presidents ultimately did not, a complete withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. After 20 years of war, the move is popular at home, but Pentagon officials and defense experts are expressing serious concerns about what comes next for the region, as well as the global war on terror. I'm talking to Republican lawmaker and combat veteran Mike Waltz. Later, a look at the life of a young Afghan woman who has so much to lose if the social progress of the last 20 years evaporates. We all know how it started. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. But for two decades, we've wondered how and when America's longest war would come to an end. Not yet 100 days into his presidency, Joe Biden delivered this answer. I'm now the fourth United States president to preside over American troop presence in Afghanistan. Two Republicans, two Democrats. I will not pass this responsibility onto a fifth. Sounds like a political victory given the popular support for withdrawal and changing views among Americans about the conflicts in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Last year, three quarters supported bringing all the troops home. Even more telling was a shift in how people felt about being there at all. The number who believe going to war in Afghanistan was the right decision has steadily declined. 20 years into the conflict, more than 2,300 servicemen and women have been killed. 10 times as many were wounded. Civilian death tolls in Afghanistan have been estimated at over 40,000. And then there's the financial toll, estimated to be as high as $2 trillion back in 2019. But for all the obvious benefits, there are real risks involved in President Biden's decision. Afghanistan could quickly fall back into the hands of the Taliban, a disaster for the citizens of that country. Afghan girls and women have made real gains in freedom at the hands of the United States and allies. Rights and education, which many fear will collapse as the last foreign troops exit. The proposed timing is also cause for concern. September 11th, 2021, in a year filled with too many grim milestones, the 20th anniversary of the largest attack on American soil may also see the United States military walking away, handing a symbolic victory to the extremists it once sought to defeat. Some veterans and defense experts are calling this another Saigon, 1975, the end of the Vietnam War, an American defeat. Florida Republican Mike Waltz is one of them. He's the first combat decorated Green Beret to serve in Congress and was a senior advisor to then President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Congressman Mike Waltz, thanks so much for joining G-Zero World. Yeah, happy to be with you, Ian. You recently said the following about President Biden's announcement of a full U.S. troop withdrawal. This announcement breaks my heart. You said the best way to cause another 9-11 to happen is to pull all of our troops out of Afghanistan when half the world's terrorist organizations are still there. Do you believe 2,500 U.S. troops remaining at this point, you think those troops are gone and it becomes a calamity, a catastrophe? Yeah, I do, unfortunately. And I think we're going to see a descend back into chaos. The intelligence community has been clear uh, that Al-Qaeda uh, does intend to resurge in the wake of a U.S. withdrawal. Uh, I do think the Taliban, unfortunately, is ascendant. I do not think the Afghan National uh, Security Forces will be able to hold uh, without our air support uh, and without our intelligence support. And importantly, that doesn't often get discussed, 
without our contract support that's helping them with a lot of their maintenance and logistics. One of the things I don't know that everyone realizes when the military goes, those contractors will go, the CIA, our eyes and ears on the ground will go. We literally will have a black hole there. We're going to repeat the mistakes that President Obama made with the full pullout of Iraq that led to the resurgence of ISIS, uh, that led to the untold hundreds of thousands of deaths around the regions, attacks across Europe, attacks across the United States. Uh, sadly, I think we're about to repeat that movie, that nightmare, uh, all over again. And the Pentagon has recently come out. Just a few days ago, they released a joint statement with NATO, and they promised that, number one, they would continue to fund key Afghan capabilities like the Air Force, Special Missions Wing, and Afghan Security Forces, and also maintain counterterrorism capabilities in the region sufficient to ensuring Afghanistan cannot become a safe haven for terrorists. So, uh, it, tell me why either you think yeah. that's not the case or to what extent that really what we're talking about is there is a compromise out there to be had. Yeah, listen, th that I understand the Pentagon's talking points, but I've been talking directly with a number of their leaders. There is no plan. Uh, they're incredibly concerned. Uh, you know, here's why this is even worse than the pullout of Iraq. In Iraq, as you know, Ian, just looking at the geography, we have all kinds of basing options to go back in when we eventually needed to as ISIS went surging across the country and almost took Baghdad uh, after they took Mosul. We have Turkey, we have Israel, we have Kuwait, we have the Gulf states, uh, we have Kurdistan and our local Kurdish allies, both in Syria and uh, Iraq. We don't have any of that in Afghanistan, none. You know, we have uh, Russia in the stands, China, Iran, and Pakistan. We give up that one base at Bagram. We literally are out of options. And the other piece that I find uh, you know, really <laughs> egregious coming from the administration is this promise to keep funding the Afghan security forces with no Americans there to oversee those billions of dollars that are going into one of the most corrupt governments, but going into the security forces as they try to fight uh, back against the Taliban. And finally, you know, one of the reasons that Biden cited uh, in his withdrawal speech was great power competition and a shift to great power competition. I fully support that. I've spent a year on a China task force. I believe we are in a cold war with the Chinese Communist Party, or at least they are with, with us, and we just need to wake up to it. But what is the only country in the world, Ian, where we have a base that borders China? Afghanistan. Why would we give up a base that's on the western flank of China, southern flank of Russia, and eastern flank of Iran if our concern are on those top three adversaries? Does that necessarily mean that you no longer have U.S. military in an advisory capability, for example? Does that necessarily mean that you no longer have the U.S. intelligence officers that are prepared and engaged directly with Afghan uh, sources on the ground? You know, I can tell you, I just spoke to someone just back from our embassy in Kabul. They're burning documents as we speak. Uh, you know, I can see a, uh, a, a small presence left there uh, but that cannot nearly handle uh, the types of sources that we meet, that we need uh, out, going out and about. Uh, and it can't possibly oversee the billions of dollars going into the Afghan army out into the hinterlands uh, that I think we'll need for effective oversight. So given all of that, what in your mind would a future U.S. presence look like, and what kind of condition-based successes could one expect? I foresee a small presence there uh, for some time. Look, we've had uh, 50,000 in Japan since World War II, 30,000 in South Korea. I mean, you know the numbers. We still have a battalion in the Sinai uh, since the Suez Canal crisis. So if we want to bring a few thousand troops home, there's a lot of places we could do it without incurring such massive risks as we do uh, in Afghanistan, and not to mention the fact that next door is five times the population in Pakistan that could be drugged into chaos as well, but this time you have a nuclear arsenal at play. I get it, hard, long, and expensive. I understand the frustration. Nobody does more than me who's lost Green Berets there 
uh, in combat. My fear is that we're going to lose many more having to fight our way back into Afghanistan just as we did into Iraq. Look at the chaos that unfolded across the region, across Europe, and inspired attacks here in the United States uh, with that decision to pull out of Iraq too soon. You know, look, I'll be candid. The next 9-11, the next Pulse nightclub, which is right on the edge of my congressional district, the next San Bernardino, that's now on Biden's watch. He owns it with this decision. So if the worst comes and uh, the Taliban actually takes over, the Afghan government falls apart, uh, what do you think, how do you think the United States responds to that? Well, I think it then, it, it, it becomes really paramount of what kind of intelligence access do we have? What kind of reporting, how blind will we be? The, 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 the agency and the intelligence community has been clear, the military goes, we go too. Uh, and what kind of reports are we seeing? I predict that we'll see a fracturing, we'll have a Northern Alliance again, and we'll be back to where we were in 2001. Except this time, we'll have an incredibly well-armed and trained 300,000 man Afghan army that will have fractured as well. I fear the civil war will be far worse, uh, and we'll find ourselves aligning with, aligning with the Northern Alliance again, fighting our way back in, uh, and possibly going after Al Qaeda training camps that are threatening the homeland. It really will be the repeat of a, you know a nightmare horror movie. I will go to China. Uh, that's the that's the big uh, sort of elephant in the room. Um, and uh, you said we're at a cold war with China, but then you walked it back a bit, and that's okay because I don't think we're in a cold war with China right now. Um, but you have talked about um, a boycott of the China Olympics. Do you think that's a good idea? I do, and to be clear, the preferred action was that the Olympics are moved, and we've repeatedly asked the International Olympic Committee to do so, uh, and they've rebuffed us now for two years. So with just 10 months to go, uh, we finally, until the Beijing Olympics in February of 22, uh, I and others introduced a resolution calling for a boycott. I don't see how, after unleashing COVID on the world, clearly covering it up, arresting journalists, arresting doctors, refusing to share data, and the ongoing genocide that two secretary of states from two different administrations have now uh, agreed is happening, that we reward Beijing with this international platform to whitewash everything that they've done to the world. And frankly, I think it sends a horrible signal and a horrible message uh, that the, the world is willing to collectively shrug their shoulders uh, at, at what's going on with uh, slave labor, ongoing rape and torture, and a mass sterilization campaign of the Uyghur women on top of Hong Kong, on top of Tibet. Uh, I, I just, I feel for our athletes. I hate it that the IOC is putting them in this situation. Uh, but at this point, I think we have to boycott. President Carter said that the boycott uh, of the Olympics in 1980 was one of the worst decisions uh, that he made as a president. Very few allies joined along. Uh, it looks like if the U.S. were to engage in a complete yeah. boycott, that the U.S. would be virtually alone in terms of major advanced industrial economies. Oh, not necessarily, Do you, do you no. worry about that? Do you worry about that? No, 100 and, so 180, that's a significant number, 180 human rights organizations from around the world are calling on the same. Uh, the, uh, I just saw a poll uh, in Canada, 63% of Canadians would support their government in a full, full boycott. Uh, there is a growing movement in the UK, Australia, Japan, uh, and others. And to your point on 1980, I also like to look at probably times in history when we didn't and we should have, uh, with authoritarian regimes that were emboldened uh, by the platform that the Olympics provides. We all know what Germany did after 1936. Absolutely. But not as many people realize that Russia invaded the Ukraine just one month after the Sochi Olympics, meaning their military planning was happening while the Olympic Games uh, were going on. And let's look at what China's done since 2008 when they last had the Olympics. And when they Xi Jinping promised the world coordinated would, them as vice president. That's yes. right. So, given that trend of history, what's next after 22? I fear Taiwan. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about good corporate governance. Well, that doesn't just apply in U.S. borders. That applies around the world, too. We're drunk on Chinese money, and it's from sports to Disney to Wall Street to our political class to our universities, think tanks and research institutions. 
Uh, and that's why this is the most insidious threat we've ever faced. And that's Mike Waltz, Congressman from Florida. And uh, my thanks to you for joining us and thank you for your service, sir. All right, great to be with you and come on down to Florida anytime. No group in Afghanistan has more on the line as American troops withdraw than young women. And this latest news shows every sign of making a bad situation worse. Uh, my name is Shaisa. Uh, I am a 22-year-old uh, university student. Uh, I'm uh, from Kabul, Afghanistan. Life has been uh, relatively normal for me in Kabul because I have had the privilege of having access to basic necessities of life and a good education. But I am a very, uh, among very small percentage of Afghans who have had such a life. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 3.7 million of ch Afghan children are out of school, but 60% of them are girls. Um, and I wish that one day all Afghans all across the country uh, can have the uh, privileges and at least basic li rights uh, that I have today. But despite having all of these privileges, uh, the fear of uh, losing my life have always been there. The mental and psychological pressure losing my life and, and not feeling completely secure and um, has um, i have left with this feeling and this um a struggle At least four civilians have been killed in a suicide bombing targeting a nato convoy in afghanistan when i was at uh, 11th grade a suicide uh, bomb attack happened in front of my school we were in the class and uh, the explosion happened, the, the windows shaked and everybody was scared. Uh, but I, actually that was the moment I decided to study politics. I have worked with uh, civil society organizations and I have participated in uh, campaigns uh, for promotion of human rights. Uh, when I heard the news of U.S. troops withdrawal, uh, the instant feeling would be, it's hard to describe it, uh, bad or good. I, I can say it can be both. I mean, depending on the, the modalities or modality of the withdrawal and uh, the realities on the ground, is this re decision really the final decision? Um, what will be the follow-up uh, policies, uh, what will happen to the peace process. What uh, Taliban wanted was the U U.S. troops withdrawal. They are getting it. And the withdrawal is unconditional. So they wouldn't have any incentive to compromise or to acknowledge the um, other side. But I think, the, you know, 65% uh, of Afghans are under the age of 25. It's a new generation, a new reality. And I think the Taliban also will acknowledge this new reality of Afghanistan and this new generation. I mean, I think this new generation will not let the dark era of the 1990s to be repeated. American uh, people need to know that Afghans have sacrificed uh, and have stood beside Americans to fight global terrorism and also for their own rights and uh, prosperity. We have suffered a lot, but we have also changed a lot. We have achievements and we have uh, progress that we all can be proud of. I am one of those achievements, and hopefully Americans do not ignore those achievements and do not ignore the fate of millions of Afghans, especially women, in a pullout that is rushed, or I would say abrupt. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you see, you like what you've heard, some of you didn't see anything. Some of you just heard, but you still liked it. We have this relationship. Take a minute to sign up to G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.